Hello, thank you for tuning in for my dialogue with Andrew Taggart. Um, I want to give some context for this conversation with Andrew. First, I want to go over some housekeeping. So if you're interested in diving into circling and experiencing circling, um, and circling is, is the practice of profoundly being with what is, and in a lot of the conversations that we go, I, I have on this channel, really for me, at the bottom of it is is really a, is what it's the bottom circling as well in a very embodied experiential way. So if you're interested in that ongoing practice, um, the Circling Institute website is the link for it is below. Um, we have weekends pretty much every month. We have a year long program, the Art of Circling, and we have an open drop in evening. So link for that below. We have a weekend coming up in a couple of weeks, I believe, and a registration for the Art of Circling has officially opened. Um, yeah, so you can have all that information just through the website. If you're interested in working with me one-on-one -on -one in private coaching or consulting, um, go ahead and email me and uh, my, my email is below as well. Okay, so Andrew, I want to call him a mystic and a philosopher. And um, I just I really enjoy him. Uh, I like his sense of humor and, uh, and his dedication in, in Zen. And I contacted him because I've been uh, really diving into this, to the Kyoto School. And I'm on my third reading of, of Religion and Nothingness by, um, uh, what's his name? Nishitani. Um, and the Kyoto School is a, is a philosophical school in Japan. And they really, in, you know, they, they're in deep dialogue with all of Western philosophy, but they really bring in the notion of emptiness. And um, I think is a, is, a, is a fount. I think there's so much there um, that I'm discovering. So I, I wanted to talk with Andrew about Nishitani and I, I, I contacted him and he happened to be reading Religion and Nothingness um, at, at the time that I, I contacted him. So it was good timing. So we cover a lot of ground and um, I hope you enjoy the conversation. And uh, if, you are, if you want to get notifications for all the videos, go ahead and subscribe and you have a great day. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> and we're live. <laughs> we're live. Welcome to my computer screen. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's so flat. <laughs> what have you been doing to it? You can see it on this end, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Last time, well, last time we were together, actually, the, the, we did a um you did an inquiry process philosophical practice with me which was really really cool oh, good. before that we had a we had a long a long conversation and then i then i i just emailed you because i hadn't seen you in a while and yeah. um, and it it turns out you we you start you were in the middle you had just started reading this book yeah, I have my copy. It just has more stickies on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and what do you think so far? Well, I'm a, I'm a Zen guy, so <laughs> I just gonna say up. this is philosophy. <laughs> What's strange is that he doesn't mention Zen that much. It's like every page is Zen. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. For example, I mean, I thought I would just very briefly, uh, since we're doing show and tell here, <laughs> this is David Hinton's book, China Root, which is uh, the subtitle is Taoism, Chan, and Original Zen. Mm. And I don't know how much you know about Rinzai Zen or, or Chan. Mm -mm. Uh, no, no, no. Hager, Hager guy. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> well, Bodhidharma is commonly seen as the, the the first patriarch of Zen and the mm. lineage. That's mm. how the story goes. He's the one who brought Buddhism from the East into yeah. 
uh, sorry, and from the West and into China. Mm -hmm. And so there's a really lovely bit about the way he taught here. Um, and it, it might be a way into the, the text. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is this is Hinton's translation. I'll give you the long version first, mm -hmm. the poetic version, then I'll give you the short version. I think the short version is more Zen actually. Yeah. So the long version is <clears throat> from, from Bodhidharma. A sep so what is Zen really? Mm -hmm. uh, Bodhidharma, a separate transmission outside all teaching, all discourses, all sutras, and not founded in fine words of scripture. It's simple pointing directly at mind. There, seeing original nature, you become Buddha. Uh, so let me, let me do the last couple lines because yeah. that's, that really is the, I feel as though that's the distillation of Zen. Yeah. Uh, but I think I can, but with, if we, because it's, in, it's originally in the idea grabs, um, the, the, the other version streamed down more imagistic poetically is direct pointing person mind. See original nature, become Buddha. And I would even put it more simply, <laughs> direct pointing, person, mind, see original nature, nat see original nature, Buddha. <laughs> there's, no, there's no becoming. <laughs> so it feels as though you get a philosophical elaboration on emptiness or shunyato or original nature yeah. in Nishitani. Yeah. So you have Zen is Zen, you might not know, is this really condensed. Um, mysterious dark enigma mm -hmm. teaching oftentimes comes through a teacher-student relationship and through zaza and or seated meditation and kishitani i feel as though is uh, trying to uh, elaborate philosophically mm -hmm. consistently mm -hmm. on the nature of zen mm -hmm. so that that's my that's my reading so far on, on the book right right that's why it's hard not in the margin to write, oh, he's talking about Zen without mentioning Zen again. Oh, there's Zen again without yeah. mentioning Zen. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, what, you know, it's interesting. So how, what happened first for you? Was it, was it philosophy or was it, was it Buddhism or something else? Or did they happen simultaneously? Yeah, I'll give you it, it, uh, philosophy. I think that there's a, I really do think there's a ladder. Um, yeah. In, in my experience. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's a certain kind of itinerary that most of us follow. Right. Um, so uh, I began to be really opened up to philosophy at the age of 29. I like to say that the, I think as we may have spoken about before, that I really wasn't asking philosophical questions, existential questions of the kind spoken of by Kishitani in the opening chapter, what is religion? Mm -hmm. uh, until I, I was leaving academia, I wasn't really cut out for it. And uh, <clears throat> what, what finally struck me was that I've been always asking objective questions. Mm -hmm. Even what is the nature of the good life can be objectified yeah. as it is in academia. Yeah. It's a perfectly fine set of questions to ask, but what is the nature of the modern world? I've still been thinking about that, but it's, a, it's an objective yeah. relationship yeah. And so what was happening as I'm falling into quiet despair is that the questions were finally being Socratically bent back on me. Yeah. And it was the emergence of genuine reflective, also dualistic consciousness, right? I began to wonder who is the one ask. I began to wonder about the nature of a good life for me, right? right? What is the good life? So that was the first step. And I've philosophized since very much in the Greek tradition. Yeah, um, and then uh, I don't know if you know this, but my, my eldest sister died in 2014, very unexpectedly, mm -hmm. and that, <clears throat> through a series of turns, catapulted me into mm. religion. Mm. All right, because I realized that I was still a secularist. Mm. Charles Miller beautifully says it's the imminent frame with a closed spin, <laughs> <laughs> which is the condition of modernity. <laughs> right, right. right. Totally. <laughs> I mean, in other words, the world is flat and that all vertical dimensions have vanished. We can, we can parse that more. Yeah. I hadn't realized that I really was standing on the ground of nihility as yeah. Shitani would put it, right? I was, I was, secularism really will allow you to see the abyss if only you actually start looking down. Right. right. And, and I started to wonder what, what more there was. 
Yeah. So religion, I do think, <clears throat> I mean, a genuine religious quest, as Nishikani calls it, is something that you get thrown into at a point at which you start to realize that there, there actually are limits to logos. There are limits to a certain kind of discursive rationality. Yeah. Um, and that's true in my experience. So since then, I'm towing the line between Mm -hmm. contemplative philosophy which i think is still very important yeah and uh, a zen practice yeah so, so before our conversation today i'm sitting in zazen and the physical and mental senses that we're all familiar with from a phenomenological point of view mm -hmm. right our ordinary sense and mental experience fades away yep oh the zen question is what is here just a koan yeah uh, it's not death right Secularism thinks oh, you're dead. <laughs> right, right, right. right? It's done. <laughs> right, can't be anything else. <laughs> yes, yes. No, no, no. It's there's there's a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So when I when I mentioned the, the 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 commonly used metaphor of the ladder, I do feel as though we keep metaphorically speaking climbing. So you might begin. I like to tell people with whom I philosophize that they might have begun with. Um, let's say uh, a counseling in high school. They were confused and parents could answer their questions. And then for some reason, they have some kind of dis ease or yeah. some searching mind, right? As Zen would call it, searching or seeking mind. And so, and, and they don't, somehow things are just out of joint. So maybe they see a therapist and that's not unhelpful to be sure. Yeah. But that's still on the ground of secularism. Yeah. And you're going to receive a certain kind of. Yeah. Um, training and functionality in the world as it is yeah. maybe later on you see a coach because you're puzzled about work matters and such yeah. you can see how or maybe you bend you bend or wend your way through self-help but mm -hmm. at some point you keep realizing that your questions are not being answered and your dis-ease obviously i'm speaking buddhist language here doesn't seem to go away yeah. and you and there's nothing really wrong with you per se you realize that these are genuine questions and yeah. they're just not really properly aired and considered right. in the context. So you keep climbing the ladder, right? Often via despair or via genuine pursuit of truth. Yeah. And that ultimately lands you in um, religion or spirituality or some such. I'm right. a little careful of use of the word spirituality today because uh, much of it is spiritual materialism. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm purposefully using religion because Kishitani is talking about religion as a very robust uh -huh. uh, mode of being. Yeah. Well, uh, Nishiti, Nishita, yeah. the guy, his teacher, the other guy, the other guy <laughs> yeah. he talks about the religious form of life, like religious religion as a form of life, which is, I believe, what I recall is I really liked it, right? He says, you know, mm -hmm. Essentially, if you actually confront your own existence and whatever it is that you work out in your relationship with it, being an existing being, he says it, that cannot not be a religious endeavor, right? Which I really, yeah. I really related with, which had me think about what I was hearing you talk about secularism, right? And you, and you said, yeah, it's, just, you know, you used the word, yeah, it was, it was still secular. And then there was a turn. I got this sense that, the, and, and maybe you're going to expound on this too. I got the sense that secular is something that you could be, if you go, don't go to church or you don't meditate, right? Or you don't do these things, but it could also, you could still be secular and go to church and you can still be secular and meditate. What is the difference? What is the difference, the, the turn into not being secular, so something other than secular, would you say? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. It's um, what is it that comes down and really animates your existence? That's mm -hmm. the shortest answer. So mm -hmm. now I'll, I'll unpack it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if, um, if you are happy to take part in market transactions and in the way of late stage capitalism, if you were happy that the shops prior to COVID are open on Sundays and you think nothing of it, 
Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, you think that raising a kind of bourgeois family mm -hmm. uh, and so that they are able to be functional members of society mm -hmm. is, is how child rearing is, is going. And if you happen to go out to church, you are still secular yeah. right? because you have taken on board a set of assumptions about the disenchanted, fundamentally flat world that many of us inhabit, the world that's deeply unsatisfying. Yeah. If only you really pay attention. But instead, if you take up what Paul Tillich beautifully calls matters of ultimate concern, yeah. and you take them with the utmost earnestness and seriousness, mm -hmm. and, and, and not only do you take them up, but the, the clarity that you come to mm. is actually animating your existence. Mm then I would say you are, you are religious. More and more, your life actually comes to take on uh, the, the, the air, the perfume of mm. the sacred. Mm. You know, if, if you wake up early in the morning, not because it's, um, not because it's said to be healthful or something, or healthy or some such, but yeah. rather because meditating is uh, a religious concern Mm. then you begin to be a religious life if you're chanting it during certain points of the day if you're treating um uh, i'm actually speaking my own existence so i'll just <laughs> i'll just turn from one to yeah. i yeah uh, i i came for example to find that um more and more my life was actually being fundamentally animated mm. by religious concerns mm. There you go. Sorry about the uh, the intimacy issues. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> secular. You were talking about secularism. Um, well, you're talking about actually the di the difference that makes the difference between sec. You know, being. You know, in some sense, it's not. I, I got this picture of. I could imagine one going about their life. Mm -hmm. at a level of content and and two pictures of the same life same content and then one being religious and one not being and one being secular and the difference that makes that difference okay so let me let me let me actually use nishitani to make the point more elegant so i think that's a nice nice set of cases you just provided us with i would say that there are two um, essential points to to round back to my thought about how your life is animated by this matter of ultimate concern. Yeah. I love he states, that way. What's that? I feel like I love yeah. Oh, oh yeah. He, he's, yeah. He, he's, he has some good stuff. He rocks. So he, he writes um, in what is religion, the point at which the ordinarily necessary things of life, including learning and the arts, all lose their necessity and utility is found at those times when death, nihility, or sin, and he goes on at some length, become pressing personal problems for us. Mm. I would call that existential rather than personal, but that's just a semantic difference. Mm. This can occur through an illness that brings one face to face with death or through some turn of events that robs one of what has made life worth living. And so I think what he's trying to uh, unfold there is a starting point one has to always come initially to the question, what is the starting point for the inquiry into or the entry or pathway into your religion? Yeah. So it, it can't just be the case that someone is going to church every Sunday. I was, I was raised in a Lutheran church. So going to church every Sunday simply won't do for Nishitani and also for me. It has to be the result of a personal pressing concern as he calls it something that you, you can't seem to get beyond you can't seem to put down really yeah that that's what begins to unfold the the quest right. i've called an existential opening in my own lingo uh but then that's not sufficient i don't think for someone who's leading a a, a religious life a religious, religious mode of being mm -hmm. um, 
that could easily be picked up and put down. Uh -huh. What happens instead is, I'm, now I'm speaking very much from my own experience, is that uh, at some point it becomes, mm. as my teacher would say, gathered into one. Mm. It's hard to find an analog in, in secular vocabulary. And so I'm going to put quotes around this mm -hmm. because it's not really what I want to say, but it's in the neighborhood of what I want to say. Mm. It's as if this matter mm. becomes an obsession as if it becomes an obsession because I don't want to psychologize it, yeah. but it's as if this becomes the most central thing. So enlightenment for me has become what is gathered into one right. and everything else is lived in the light of this felt understanding. Yeah. It can't not be. Yeah. Everything else is, is everything else shines forth with it. So, uh, Cutting wood is perfectly a fine thing to do, but it is no longer separate from right, uh, right. This 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 religious matter. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it's 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 colored. Everything comes to be colored by it. Yeah, it can't be uncolored. Yeah. So once you put those together, I've I've you know I've I've entered right. the, the set of religious questions. Yeah, and I haven't put the, Not only have I not put them down. But I've also come to concentrate, yeah. right? Really bring everything in yeah. my life to a point of uh, what was oneness or, or unity, such that it can start to raise itself up for me, yeah. the matter at hand, as a as uh, as like in it as as what is like an obsession. Then I am properly leading a fully religious life. And what I'm doing here is kind of jamming. This is partly my own thought, and it's partly thinking with Nishitani. Right, right. Yeah. I like to jam. Yeah, <laughs> a lot. I like to jam. Yeah. When it actually, I think that really does really communicate it. Right. On one sense, there's a there's an opening. There's a sense in which. <laughs> it's. It's, it, you know, and what's so interesting about this is, I don't, it's saying my internet's unstable again. Well, we'll see. We'll see how the, how <laughs> it's stabilized in the present moment. There's this sense in which no one can actually be ready, it seems, for a transformation, right? Like it's uh, that thing that you can't actually choose um, because to be able to understand it presupposes the transformation, right? Of the person mm -hmm. to be able to understand it, right? So there's this, there's this part of I think transformation in general, and I think especially like when done, say via the logos, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. um, where one hears the logos for the first time and the gathering happens and you're gathering and it's gathering, you no longer hear just Heraclitus, but you you hear, hear through Heraclitus into the logos and then all of a sudden you realize there's, a, there's something that animates everything, right? Mm -hmm. Through everything. Right. And if that really speaks to you and grabs hold of you, it's a, yeah, it's the knowing, the no, that, I think that level of knowing is knowing through somehow being coupled by what you know. Right. It's like, it's knowing via being changed or transformed in the process of knowing that. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the, that's the thing about philosophy for me anyways that's been like if that if that hadn't happened i don't think i could have stuck with reading all this stuff and like being obsessed by all these things and but essentially it's that it's that sense of it where you know you read a text or something like that and then you look up and 
your normal perception, you look at the couch and then all of a sudden you see that you really see the couch, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you really see, you see your seeing of the couch and you see the thing that you had never seen before of the couch mm -hmm. and that, that, that place where the world starts to glow and animate this. And then what I heard you say is really, what I really like about the obsession part is perhaps the religious aspect of that is this, like that, the thing I'm talking about, it seems like one can, one can like, without any notice can have that kind of experience or, oh, like they, you see the, whether or not you want it or not, whether or not you could want it or not, something mm -hmm. happens and boom, that's, that shift happens. Yes. This, this, this obsession with the one, right? Mm -hmm. That one seems more like a discipline, I gather. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Yeah. I think, I think to put it somewhat poetically, yeah. uh, the Pierre Ardo once said, all education is conversion. Hmm. If you haven't come across Ardo, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you love him. He's, oh yeah. He, yeah. I love him. Okay. Great. Beautiful. Uh, education is conversion, he says in passing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think he's referring to metanoia, right? The mm -hmm. fundamental change of heart, and that can that can begin with that kind of experience that you were just you were just pointing us to. So far, so good. Necessary, but not sufficient, right? Because it it comes and goes, yeah. right? You have, I mean, I remember the first time my my when I meditated. And uh, we were sitting in the Upper East Side in New York City at the time, back in 2012. I had never meditated before, as I say. She had. We held hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a little kumbaya version. Yeah, yeah. I could really get my legs in a certain position. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't even a pretzel. It was sort of a quarter pretzel. It was yeah, totally. mangled pretzel. Right, right. 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 The back's all hunched. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, I don't know what we're doing. My eyes are closed and my da. We, 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 were, uh, we went down from the fifth floor. Uh, we were very close to Central Park. After we crossed the threshold into Central Park, it was kind of a, a, a light Kensho or a light Satori. It was uh, the falling away of the ego self, mm. which lasted for a couple of hours. And everything was seen in the first light. You start to get a sense of what these enlightenment, this is not enlightenment, but what, what a sense of these enlightenment poems are about when they say, I never, I, I, not until now did I know that the sun has always been round. Mm. There are all these Zen poems that don't mm. make a lot of sense if you haven't begun mm. to have some of these experiences. They go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> cherry blossoms, how interesting. <laughs> but that's, that's, the, that's the opening, right? You find various ways of opening. Nishitani mentions death or illness or some such. There can also be this genuine sense of awe. Uh, at, right? the Kant speaks of the starry, starry skies above me. We could go further and say that they're not even above me, right? There's the bodying forth of the starry skies and nothing else. So we begin to notice the mystical experience as being the necessary but not sufficient condition. Mm -hmm. It's really important today because I think a lot of people, put it crudely, get off on this sort of experience. Right, right. And then they get fixated on it and it becomes a form of spiritual materialism. And they, right. they're interested in state changes and peak experiences and right. growth and all it's of these become the sorts of things. Productivity. Yes, of course, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Illusion, it's all to work. <laughs> but if you if you if you took it as a as a clue or a sign, then there does become some kind of practice or discipline. Right. And this is why psychedelics might be helpful, but they're never sufficient because it is actually the the the, the full transformation is the realization of yourself as being nothing other than that one reality. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the practice, at least in Zen, is it becomes somewhat pedestrian. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when they're sitting, nothing happens. I was, I was joking. Uh, I was joking recently about our, our last home session, our last home retreat. And I was just saying the most remarkable thing about the retreat is that there's nothing whatsoever remarkable about it. Yeah. When I was sitting, I was sitting. When I was walking, I was walking. When I was eating, I was eating. When I was sleeping, I was sleeping. Right. I mean, the, the practice itself becomes something that begins to 
allow for the kind of integration so that it no longer seems as if that was a special, yeah, overly enticing experience or opening. In the final analysis, it was nothing but a helpful clue to get you started on the path. Mm. 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 This is very important. Otherwise, you remain as, and you remain very dualistic. Like, oh, there are these wonderful experiences I've had, and there's pedestrian ordinary life. Right. Yeah, that won't do. Yeah, yeah, totally. The the sense of one. So one of the things that's been great about for me having these these um, these dialogues that go into that go into uh, you know, more technically speaking, the, the dialectic that that kind of lights in the dialogos, right? Those moments where you know something something opens up and it becomes, you could say, you start to you start to listen with your speaking, and then you speak with your listening, and those two, that interpenetration of that third thing, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. starts to happen. And with John, John Verveke and, and Christopher and a lot of the people that I've been dialoguing with, um, you know, as we've been having these conversations and then noticing that happening and when it doesn't happen and then having mm -hmm. them being cognitive scientists and, you know, all the different frames in which they, they come about it and concerns that they have, it's been, um, it's got, it's got this, this um you could say this gravity or this kind of sense of gathering and getting and really mapping it out in some way right mm -hmm. um and so one of the things that we've been lately considering and this is kind of what had me start reading um uh the kyoto school right mm -hmm. it's starting to look at which this touches on so many different things as, as you could imagine, mm -hmm. right? Of mm -hmm. what would it, what does it mean, okay, to say that a conversation, and you could say probably most conversations, right? Whether or not they're philosophical conversations or normal conversations or average conversations or therapy conversations, in some sense are arise out of narrative, right? Like uh, in, on some level, they arise out of narrative. They mm -hmm. a narrative hosts it. The, a narrative mm -hmm. determines it. A narrative mm -hmm. it's part of a greater narrative. Mm -hmm. And that and we've been looking at the idea of like, well, it, in in the moment where dialectic goes to dialogos, right? Mm -hmm. What if we said that? Wh what is it to say that a conversation or a dialogue? So it does not is not born out of narrative, but it's born out of sunyata, right? Mm -hmm. It's born out of it's born out of emptiness. And so it that's must been, be. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, yeah. T tell me more. T say more about that. Tell me, I, that that's my sense of it too. But 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 put some put some logos on that one. <laughs> <laughs> put some logos on that. <laughs> <laughs> that pastrami. <laughs> hey, you got pastrami and rye here. And you got your <laughs> um, okay, well, I haven't been privy to your conversations, uh, but let's let's. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some some uh, narrative unfolding. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll keep this in a Zen key, a kind of Zen philosophical key. Yeah. Where does that come from, and where does it go? Yeah, it's a very common Zen koan. Yeah. Okay, so there's there's narrative arising. Yeah. Where did it come from? Where did yeah. it go? Yeah. Well, that's already we're already in meditation. But you, you, you be you be if you ask where does it come from, it doesn't come from. It's not beget by more narrative. You mm -hmm. could just keep asking where does if you thought that were true, where does that narrative come from? And so the architecture of narrativity must arise out of some other ground. In fact, it's not some other ground, but it's some more elemental, more original ground. Yeah. Yeah. But it can't actually have, to speak in dualistic terms for a moment, 
the same quality as narrativity. Right. So presumably it is the absence of that narrativity. You begin to investigate that. It's easier through meditation and you begin to, to find that there's no thingness yeah. as, as the groundless ground. Yeah. No thingness can just mean uh, <clears throat> in the first place, the absence of, uh, absence of uh, let's say any kind of phenomenology in terms of our, phys our, our, our sense experience. Mm. Okay. So where does phenomenology rise out of? Mm. If you stop at, if you stop at the kind of cogito or some kind of right, limited consciousness, then you haven't really taken the inquiry far enough because you can still say, well, what, where does that come from? What, what makes that possible? Mm. Right? If you're going to be a good Kantian or, or Husserlian, keep asking the question, mm. right? What are the conditions of possibility for limited subjectivity? Yeah. Okay. Or go back to the mental sense. So you have more rationalist or idealist schools, as mm -hmm. Kishitani wants to point us to. Where does that come from? What is the condition of possibility for the arising of mental phenomena of that sort? Right. right. And all you have to do is get into an aesthetic exercise by, and the simplest thing is to take them away. Yeah. Once you take them away, as we do in meditation, there's a sinking away of sensations, uh, sense perceptions, feelings, and thoughts. And if you just ask what is here, you already, there's no you, but there, there is the sense that there is the ground, the elemental ground, or what Bodhidharma will call the original nature, that is that from which you were calling narrativity, but really all, all phenomena arise. Right. They're, they're right. And this is not, this is not nihility. This is not, this is not nihilism. Mm -hmm. It's what Nishitani wants to call absolute nothingness. Right. Right. Absolute no thingness, yeah. no gross objects, no gross narratives. Right. Huh. So interesting. One of the things I've noticed in, especially, I'm the, I'm I'm much more familiar his, um, with Tibetan Buddhism. Um, I'm less I, the groovier, the groovier kind. <laughs> yeah, like the Tibetan. Like, it it seems it seems to me, anyways, that Zen, as far as I can tell, Zen's like Zen's like more about it's like not it right no that's not it it's not it that's it not it <laughs> it just seemed like the tibetans are a little bit more like no let's try to say it <laughs> they're like colors uh -huh. and uh -huh. the articulation in a in, in more of a you know their their angle it just seems like it's a lot more the feminine hindu element of it or something like that is a lot more just present in in tibetan buddhism i think that it seems like that it, essentially they're saying Emptiness is form and form is emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. However, the, the, the thing that I'm, I'm sensing about the Japanese, they really, I, it's something, it's really something, well, first of all, I noticed the foreignness mm -hmm. of it to myself, right? And, I, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm curious about, I noticed that foreignness, right? And I'm, um, and I kind of ask myself, well, what is that thing I'm noticing? Because it's a, a strange thing to notice, to notice foreignness, right? Because if it's really foreign, it seems like I wouldn't notice it, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> so what is that thing? The pale, huh? Yeah, what is that thing yeah. I'm not, not noticing? But uh -uh. that unfamiliarity, and I, and I noticed what the kind of like the phenomenological experience of mm -hmm of approaching it and understanding it or attempting to understand it is man, is it so easy to be mm -hmm. a Yankee, right? Mm -hmm. I really feel American in doing it because I'll, I will just take that nothing within a fraction of a second and it'll turn it into something, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, yeah. quickly, right. right? There's so yes. quickly, I just notice about the, the whole Zen mm -hmm. thing is it's like, so 
it's uh it's 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 humbling in one sense but i think that it's so humbling and that it i feel so clumsily american right in in trying to when i attempt to understand it and on some level i feel reveals it to me right just my difficulty in in grasping it or or comprehending it and the way i struggle with it seems like in some way i'm like ah this is but this is a way it kind of shows it's showing itself to me in some way it's 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 hard to describe, but there's a particular mm -hmm. nothingness, right? That Zen seems mm -hmm. to show that uh, mm -hmm. that feels like really deep in a way that's hard for me to understand. Yeah, there there are two really, uh, I think, apropos replies uh, the, the the first is, is somewhat of a joke it's to say that in the west we're very voluptuous <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i mean i yeah i, I do think that there uh, there's a via positiva that people of a mystical persuasion may like and it comes through many forms of christianity that is say as much as you can until you finally exhaust speech and then you can rest in god or rest in the divine yeah. that is not zen it's the via negativa right. so uh, that brings me to this second remark from Masao Abe, who's older than the Kyoto School. Uh, he has a book called Zen and Western Thought. It's also very good, right? The number of these philosophers mm. in Kyoto are grappling with Western traditions and East. It's one of those beautiful moments in time when it's a genuine conversation yeah. between East and West. Uh, well, he, he defines Zen the following way. It's very similar to the Bodhi, uh, to, to the Bodhidharma quote I, I, I cited before. He says, Zen is, quote, direct pointing at man's capital M mind. That's mm -hmm. it. Direct pointing at man's mind. And uh, I'm using the word man here, even though it's no longer mm -hmm. politically correct, because it's hard to, I've had a hard time finding a different word to put in there. Yeah. So it's like, it's each, 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 uh, each ordinary mind is, as the Dharma Sutra would say, is big mind. Right. Um, that's true. Um, but he's trying to get it, but he also means all ordinary minds are big M minds. So the word man is, 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 is helpfully ambiguous there. Mm. Um, but that's what, that's what sitting is. That's what Zazen is. Mm. When my Zen teacher says, don't turn practice, practice is the Zen word. It's the kind of often used Zen word for um, <laughs> many things, but not the least Zazen. Mm. Don't turn it into anything, he notes. Yeah. He says it often. Don't turn it into anything. Now, what happens? Uh, whenever you sit, you're almost constantly, it's the simplest thing in the world, direct pointing at the nature of reality. Yeah. That's all that sitting is. Yeah. Except that once you start sitting or thinking or whatever, you are invariably turning what is not arising and most especially what is arising into something. Mm. Right? Mm. That's, when I say turning it into something, that's even before narrativity, right? That's, that's even, that's one grosser form of turning things into something to be sure. Oh, you know, I had a, you can tell a story of some kind or another. Yes, that's one. Yeah. Um, but even something as simple as craving. So you don't even say it, but craving, don't want to sit here now. Yeah. You've turned sitting into something, yeah. namely craving, tanha, right? clinging, craving. Right. So, so uh, uh, what's really quite beautiful about the, the Zen approach is it's, a, it's called a direct path. Yeah. If one really wants to realize one's true nature mm. to wake up, then there, there's no way around. All it has to do is enable you to just sit and cease turning everything into something. Or another way of putting it is to cease seeking mind, cease wandering mind. Yeah. So, so Zen is a practice of stopping. Yeah. So everything that we ordinarily do in our in our sense experience and then in our in our mental lives stop <laughs> that's it just stop not as an act of will but as a moment of grace right so 
I like to say that Taoism and, 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 and Zen actually are philosophies of grace. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's, it can be very foreign for people because we're so used to the, we're very used to trying. Yeah. We're used to seeking and we're used to the voluptuous nature of language. And the, 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 the English language is so de deliciously voluptuous. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But remember I quoted Bodhidharma, wordless teaching, wordless teaching. Mm. I, my, my teacher hears about my readings of sutras. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> or whatever. He's like, no, you, <laughs> I mean, they're not against reading sutras. They're important discourses, mm -hmm. but it's very easy to mentally understand something and think that you have what, what is famously called opened your Zen eye and you haven't, you're going the wrong way. It turns out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very easy to, there's nothing wrong with intellectual understanding per se, right. but when it is overweened, yeah, it comes to actually take you in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Direct pointing at a man's mind. Well, allow there to be a direct point. Yeah. Right. You have to be in some respects, uh, in some basic respect, you have to be very stupid yeah. to, to be a Zen practitioner. It's a, it's a cheeky <laughs> joke, but right? You have to be almost yeah. overly yeah. stupid. You have to be almost overly stupid to really get nothingness. Right, right. I.e. to be nothingness. Yeah. Yeah, because we're so we're so clever, right? We're trying to always make something, do something, try something, be something. Mm -hmm. It's none of that. Of course, it's everything, but it's none of that. Yeah, yeah. The so I've been going down, and I met you know I meditate every day, and I have been for years and years. Um, but lately, what I've been doing, and I've been specifically you know, really kind of contemplating emptiness, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, a, in, in, the, in, in the most um, direct way that I remember doing it anyways. Uh, and I, I've been going down to, I live on, um, I live in Alameda, in the center of Alameda. Alameda is like a little island off of, um, next to Oakland in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's like a canal and I live, my, my house is like right by the canal. So basically I just go mm -hmm. out and then I go down a few flights of stairs and then there's just this little, this little dock with this little canal, right? And I've been just making a point every day for the last, it's been this last week and a half um, mm -hmm. that I go out right before the sun comes up and I just, I meditate just facing the sun. And I have to say, just doing that, I've never done that consistently or made it a point to do that before. And I have to say, there's something about that that just particularly, and I don't know if it's, I actually don't know if it's just, if it's something about the sun or that time in the morning or, mm -hmm. but it, it seems to carry with me throughout the yeah, day. Yeah, what, what is that? Yeah. What is that? It's, and this is what, I think what I was gonna, I think this is, I think this is what it is. Well, okay, so a couple things. One, there's something about just openly, I don't even know how to put it. It's not exactly contemplating, but it's just being open to the notion of emptiness, right? And just kind of having an openness or an intention to be open to that and then sitting. Mm -hmm by the water, which is usually still with just some, just a few ripples every once in a while, just, in, just enough to remind you that those are, those are reflections in the thing, right? And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's some way in which those, it feels as though the reflections in the water and the water have been teaching me something about emptiness, right? Because, mm -hmm. You know, I'll be looking, I'll have these kinds, and they're not exactly thoughts. It's strange. It's almost like the, it feels like the, you're part of the water or something that just happened to be 
reflections, if you will, that just happen in my mind instead of the water or something like that. It's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. But it's a sense of where I'm noticing, you know, the house is being reflected in the water, the sky being reflected in the water, the trees being reflected in the water. And then a wave will go, go through. And then you could just see just a little bit of a gap between in between the waves where you could tell it's a reflection and it's not the real thing. And then I'll have the thought, just having this thought about like, well, what if there weren't any of the things reflected and there's just the water, yet the reflections are still there, but there's nothing reflected. Mm -hmm. And I've been having an intuition that I think that's actually more what it's like. And there's a, so I think the thing that I'm carrying with me is this sense in which um, the things in which I am concerned with and even my, the concernfulness itself and the one concerned and all the myriad of 10,000 things in the world, right, throughout the day, have more of a sense that at any point the wind can come by and it'll go. It's like everything's just a like a like a like a faint, just the faintest little ripple on top of emptiness. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, but 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 careful. All, that, all that's beautiful, but, but don't ruin it at the end. It's not on top of emptiness. Right. It is emptiness. Yeah. Empty emptiness is emptiness is form form is emptiness. There is there is in a way no on top of or underneath. Right. Right. There's just emptiness. There's there's just the water. Yeah. And of course and of course it, it will manifest itself in temporary names and forms or in the ten thousand things. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, it, in, including thoughts and feelings, whatever that all, all exactly. This is this is this is all as my teacher says, you're sitting on it. And of course, you're not just sitting on it, it's sitting on you, and it's everywhere and nowhere, and we can use as many as we want to, but there's no on top of. Right, right. And there's no underneath, and there's no beside. Right. There's no around the corner. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. I think I was like more saying that is like the analogy for the sense of just considering, well, what if there wasn't anything reflected, but yet there was still the reflections? And, and, it, and there's this sense in which the intuition is something like, oh, like actually maybe that is the way in some sense it is. So that sense of caring over, and these, this is me trying to put words to it. The experience is one of where feeling more of a sense of, of awareness feeling like a field in which all the all the things in the awareness are like fluctuations in the very field just that sense of things um it's yeah. lighter it's lighter. Yes. that's like who is who is who is who is the one having that sense of things it's the the field it's that the well the one the one having the sense of things starts it's like it feels like part of the field in which everything's rippling rippling as and through yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah the point of view has to fade away mm -hmm. right right There's another way of describing it. Because the, 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 the ocean, the water and ripples metaphor is a very old one, it's a very lovely one. It's a very helpful one. Sometimes people will speak about a screen, uh, a movie screen that's um, upon which there are no movies. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the empty. <laughs> it's perfect. Perfect timing. Very perfect. Yeah. Very perfect. Yeah. 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 
I, yeah, so the, the, I'm sure you've heard of the screen uh, analogy before, the empty screen, and then there are uh, various movies. Yeah. We say on the screen, but that's saying too much again. Yeah. It's just, it's as if the movies are nothing but the screen and coming temporarily out of the screen. Right. I have another analogy that I like. Um, that gets close to it's um, so we have three modes of experience we have waking life mm -hmm. sleeping and deep sleep yeah. right. so uh, take deep sleep yeah okay nothing I'm really no gross objects this is it I'm in, really enjoying this conversation with you right yes now. yes yeah thank you. yeah me too so take take deep sleep right um, in, in, a, in a gross sense, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. There's no memory. Right. There's, there, there's no. There's no finite mind to record. Right. Um, but in meditation, there can be awareness mm. illuminating deep sleep. Mm. Now, that is not. That is not a separate awareness casting light on a deep sleep state. Yeah. No, it's more like it's. I mean. State is not enlightenment, but it, it's 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 another analogy. It's as if the deep sleep is self illuminating. And that would be another way of thinking about nothingness or emptiness or shunyata. Yeah. It's it's a self luminous deep sleep, or it's um, it 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 recognizes or realizes itself. Uh, there's there's no one outside of that frame yeah this is why i'm trying to put it in these words who recognizes or sees the deep sleep no the deep sleep is uh, as it were knowing itself uh, yeah even that even that is to sound a little too reflexive and yeah. english language is not helpful here yeah so self-illuminating might be as close as it gets mm -hmm. right Nothingness self illuminates. Right. 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 Of course, it also then, as we might imagine, has this is what I might call stillness, mm -hmm. but it also has a tendency for movement as mm -hmm. part of any Eastern metaphysic and as part of our own experience, right? So then it then it can move into waking state and then it can right body forth then these phenomena that we're accustomed to. And it can, it can move into any kind of Hugian dream states or whatever else, and that would be a different, but that's still, based, the, the, the deep sleep is yes. that out of which, from which and nothing other than these temporary right. gross forms are coming. Yeah. Body. And the problem, the problem is that we just forget. I mean, the key is the problem is the that's all forgotten so that it seems as if deep sleep really isn't anything mm. and only the waking sleep. I mean, in, in modern life, the waking state is what is privileged. Mm. Dreams are unreal and deep sleep may or may not have happened. That is something that we seem to be able to deduce from the fact that we say, Oh, I slept well last night. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this, this particular analogy turns it all around, suggesting that the, the nothingness, yes. self-illuminatingly so, mm. is, is the, the fertile ground mm. from which emerge mm. temporary shapes and forms. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a helpful analogy in as much as it also moves us beyond nihilism, because I think one of the scary things for a number of people at a practical level is that they'll say, oh my goodness, without the ordinary sense objects or gross objects of ordinary experience, what is there? It's just what they would call void or emptiness in the non-Buddhist sense. Right. Right? Yeah. And so it's lonely. And all you do is ask, well, who is the one who who is the one who's there experiencing loneliness? Right? You still have a point of view. The people people could only get to nihilism that's still dualistic. There's still a point of view that allegedly is seeing this void-like 
state. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, press it one further and ask, who is this one? Who is this one? Yeah. Once that begins to transpair, then there's just what was being described before the self self luminous right. sleep. Yes. Well, it's interesting, kind of going back into, you know, my what I'm. I'm hearing Nishitani talk about, right, in the address of nihilism. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, the kind of where he says, you know, on some level, Nietzsche, he went to a, he, he went to a certain level, but he didn't go far enough into it, right? Mm -hmm. And I, the, the, he went halfway, <laughs> right? And basically, yeah. Nishitani saying, no, the great, and he's, he's referencing the great doubt. Uh -huh. Right. That's the, that's exactly from Zen. You might not right. know. Yeah. Capital can you say, capital can you say D is more dead. about what the like what Zen what that is from a Zen perspective, the great doubt. What is the great yeah. doubt? Okay. Well, there's a really good book. I'll just refer you and others to by by Boshan, which are um, looking at my bookshelf to make sure I have it right. It's called Exhortations on the Great Doubt or some such. Mm -hmm. Include it in the notes. Yeah. But that's not quite right. Yeah. The, this is a this is a very important um, it's called a notion in Rinzai Zen and I don't know as much about I don't know that much about Soto I'm a Rinzai Zen practitioner so this is the koan studies and uh, and things of that sort. Well, great goes something like this: Do you have a question? Who am I? Okay. Or where does this all come from? Or Hu Neng asked one of his students: um, Before good and evil, what is your original face? Okay, so I mean, there are plenty of these questions. And uh, so once this a question actually arises for you as an existential question, mm -hmm. for me, it's homelessness. So I, 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 what really brings me to, 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 to this deep inquiry is a sense of homelessness. I'm, so the realization I've never been at home in the world. I'm not at home here. This is, this is not a home. And that's not, I'm articulating it, but it's in the bones. Yeah, yeah, very okay. good. So you begin, you begin with, that's, that's, that's the beginning of a doubt in the, in the Zen sense, not, not, in this, yeah. <laughs> not in the modern skeptical sense. Yeah. This is not Cartesian by any means. Yeah. It's an existential doubt. And then when it begins, then you need some kind of practice and the teachers can help and it starts to build. Right. And it builds and it builds and it becomes greater and greater. Like you can't. So if it's a koan, let's just say, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who, who am I? Who am I? Right. And so forth. And you think, oh, it's not. And if you go through, wait, wait a minute, I'm not the personality. I'm not, uh, you know, sensations come and go. My direct experience is such that I can't really pin myself down to the gross physical body. If I really, if I'm really being honest with myself and going deep enough yeah. and the mental sense comes and goes, Right, right. And we think that there's a mind as a container, but I have no evidence for the mind in container. Mm. It's just, a, it's just a rising phenomenon. This is why Buddhism calls it a mental sense. Yeah, and, and therefore is no different in certain respects from the physical senses. So, yeah, I mean, so, the, the, uh, so I, I, I can't say that I'm the, I'm the, I'm the mind. I don't, well, what am I? Who am I? Okay. So as that builds, it builds, it builds, and it's easier to to, to build it through zazen because the seated meditation has this potency about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it can come to what is called the great doubt or also known as the, the doubt block mm -hmm. and that means that everything kind of concentrates and freezes yeah. into this uh, it was sometimes described uh, by one by one teacher as being uh, frozen 10,000 I may be wrong about this but frozen 10,000 feet below the surface of the earth, everything comes to freeze. Uh, That's the great doubt. You can't get around it. There's nothing, there's no, nothing other than it. Yeah. Everything becomes it, you become it. Right. And this is, so for Zen, this is a, for Rinzai Zen, it's a very important moment because it's one way of trying to articulate the, put this in quotes, the moment before awakening. There's no way to turn. There's no way to turn toward it, no way to turn away. It is, the great doubt is everything. Ooh. including Ooh. the questioner. The questioner can no longer stand back because as you know from reflective consciousness, yeah. this is just one of the problems with philosophy. Right. There's, always this, there's always the urge to step back 
and see see it as something else. It's yeah. really right. Yeah. But no longer the case. It is behind me. I. It is under me. It is through me. The great right. doubt that is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there is just no way of getting around it. There's no way of squirming out from it. Right. Right. Well, once that is quote unquote broken through, then that's one way of describing enlightenment and Zen. Right. So it's a bit like the moment before. Right. Uh, right. Realiza realization. In the great Tao. So I think it's, I think it, I think it, oh, so I think it's, it's very clear that this is very different from ancient skepticism. Mm -hmm. There might be some similarities yeah. here, right? which was interested in yeah. using doubt in a way to apoke, to arrive at the suspension of judgment. Sometimes there was a felicitous ataraxia or freedom from mental disturbance. Right. Uh, so it's a kind of certain non committal mm -hmm. equipose found in ancient skepticism. Modern skepticism of the, fine, kind we find, of the kind we find in Descartes tries to use the power of doubt. Mm to arrive at a place of mm -hmm. certainty. Mm -hmm. Neither of these would be how great doubt operates. It is so existential that it just lights up. Yeah. Yeah. The entire inquiry and there, there is no escape. Right? As I like to say, I like to say, I said this recently in a class I was teaching, all the exits are blocked. <laughs> right? uh, Every exit is sealed off. Yeah. Yeah. So to say that I'm trying to dramatize it a bit, uh, it's intense, right? I happen to be an intense fellow anyway, but it's a very intense uh, kind of inquiry we're talking about here. Yeah. No holds barred, if you will. Right. It's that, and it's, it sounds like it's the kind of thing that it, it, it sounds like it's insidious, right? It reveals mm -hmm. the, the, like the, the utter, I, as you're talking about it, it just reminds me of that, just that sense in myself where, you know, it's interesting, it not, not, not like the narcissism and the great doubt, it almost seems like narcissism seems to be the, the very expression of moving away from the great doubt, right, on some mm -hmm. level, right, just and it's especially in its insidiousness, right? This, I don't mean just narcissism in the sense of like the, you know, the, the Trump, you know, the, the, the obvious version of it, but just the, any, any yes. sense of um, outsourcing this one uh, via inference, right? It's subtler and subtler, and it can be really, really, really subtle, especially in, in especially in Northern California, man, you can, uh, mm -hmm. you can, you, you can outsource your identity, the subtlest little states, right? Yes, yes. In that, that, uh, in, in this is, this is actually one of the things in circling I've noticed is where a lot of things end up um, kind of opening up relationally mm -hmm. and you know because this happens a lot just in social interactions for people is is a lot of people speak from anxiety right without even knowing mm -hmm. that they're speaking from anxiety or they're they're in some automaticity on some level mm -hmm. making sure that the image that I don't notice that I'm monitoring and imagining you have of me, right? <laughs> right. On some level, I'm I'm anticipating what you need or want or such, and then I need, you know, and then so I'm speaking to that directly. So there's this sense of something has to happen, right? Oh, yeah. Right. That that kind of insidious sense, repetitive insidious sense, and I've noticed in circling. Mm -hmm. um, Especially, especially when it's usually with people who have been doing it for a while, right? And 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 have a you know they're they're fairly advanced in 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 the practice where mm -hmm. the the group can kind of attune, or I'll put it like this: the, the the group can start to notice in their nervous system when another person is in some way in that automaticity, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
as and it registers for them as some kind of suffering or some kind of some kind of contraction or something like that. And people just know, they just they just express it. And what's interesting about that in an inner subjective level like situation, I've seen this a lot. I've see, actually seen this a lot, especially when in the real deeper longer trainings with people who become you know facilitators and practitioners where it's like there's a moment of terror right where somebody saying something out of some unconscious need to exist <laughs> right not aware that they're that they're doing that right oh looks like you're frozen Where'd I leave you off? Somebody is saying something out of some yeah. unconscious need to. Yeah. 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 And then, so when people start to like catch that mid sentence and people have this experience of like, oh, oh my, there's a moment of terror, right? And I'm, and I'm wondering about, and then it's like, there's this the moment terror? of terror, right? Of, yes. And then what they'll do is they'll sometimes they'll they'll kind of collect and they'll do the thing again, <laughs> right? They'll mm -hmm. say the thing that's like in it, essentially outsourcing, really outsourcing the, I guess their sense of, of their sense of self. Mm -hmm. And then it's caught again. And it's caught again, and it starts to get. And there's a certain moment where intersubjectively, okay. I've just seen this over and over and over again with people where it's like, it's really intense. It's like terrifying. Mm -hmm. And terrifying because the sense of self is yeah. becoming, is being exposed. Yeah, yeah. It's being okay. exposed, exposed. Yes. And I think the thing that's terrifying is, is it underneath that, behind that, the person has this sense of there's the nihilism, there's the nullity, right? That Nishitani is talking about, not the emptiness, but the sense of the vacant, dry, arid sense of this fear that if I'm not somebody in your eyes, right? Some particular person in your eyes, then I'm nothing, right? Yes. And so mm -hmm. there's this, and, and when it happens interpersonally, they can be extru, extru, it can be excruciating. Um, yes. But when that's people very good with it, right? That's very good. Yeah. So from, uh, I've been playing around with the use of somebody as a very simple articulation of an ego self recently. So the person that you're describing is having an experience in which he or she is imagining it social world consists of a field of somebodies yeah. and that he or she, let's just say she, to keep the pronoun uses easy, she is a somebody in that field of somebodies. And she's been involved in perhaps a lifelong process. We can probably get the development health theories here for a moment. A fairly lengthy process in trying to show or prove or trying to be somebody or manifold somebodies. Okay, so when the when the jig is up so to speak mm -hmm. and that no longer can that particular manufacturing process ceases then for a moment the terror comes from still being i, I would argue mm -hmm. in a kind of empty somebodyness i'm using that in the ordinary sense yeah who from the vantage point of a field of somebodies is looking over and saying oh my god i couldn't possibly be nobody for nobody is the absence of being somebody in the field of somebody's. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't be nobody. So that's the, that's the nihilism. Yeah. But what hasn't really been understood oh, yet, right? Well, I can't be. I I as a as a yeah. It's it's yeah. It's, un, it's it's false. But I now as a formal somebody, posit. Nobodyness as the absence of somebodyness, mm. and it terrifies me. Yeah. But Nishitani is absolutely right. Keep going. You yep. just keep, that's that. The inquiry has only begun, really, <laughs> to put it to put it very honestly, because there are other forms of somebody that are much subtler and subtler, right? 
yeah. right? kind of formal aspects of being mind or the silhouette of a physical body is, is, is or they're, they're really, you can, you can really start to notice subtler and subtler, take myself to be this. Yeah. But when all those, when they increasingly melt away, what I like to tell people is that the actual experience, the very thing you're fearing is precisely a, is precisely a concoction. You've made up a fantasy. The actual experience is peaceful. Most of the time, the actual experience, go to the actual experience, not to the mental concoction. Mm -hmm. It's peaceful. It's yeah. open. It's spacious, as Schubert Berger would say. Yeah. So you know, the, the, the terror is just one breath before the letting go of that particular mm -hmm. vestige of somebodyness. Yeah. And in the relaxation, there's just peacefulness. The body finally relaxes for the first time. I mean, the contractions of the body cease. So you know? gorgeous too. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And watch, and actually, yeah, and, and then watching somebody kind of go through that and mm -hmm. recognize that the thing I was actually terrified is actually the thing I most, it's like the most beautiful experience in the world, right? On some level. Of course. Right? And then watch yeah. the innocence and the surprise of that, yet the surprise and the recognition of being with somebody in that is just so, it's so, it's stunning. It's really, mm -hmm. really stunning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad it was yeah, my, 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 my joke is, my, my simple joke is that we should, not should, we are always already nobodies. We just need to know this. Yeah. I mean, nobody's in the ontologically deep sense. Yeah. Because otherwise we are in deep trouble. To be somebody, I would argue, is to already be involved in dukkha or suffering. Yeah. I'm not saying that it leads to suffering. I'm suggesting that to try to be somebody always already ensnares me in suffering. Right. So what a counterintuitive, that's why I love these Eastern teachings. I'm, I'm very fond of Taoism, which we haven't really discussed at length. They, they really do say, look here, you've got it all wrong, really. <laughs> you, think, you, you, you think it's, you think, you really think it's, it's, it's much, and you've got it all wrong, and it's much simpler than you think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Stop trying to be somebody, and what naturally arises, if I may speak Taoistically, is nobodyness. The nobodyness ceases to have to be anybody whatsoever, and therefore, really, in some respects, could be anybody. Mm. Right? This is why teachers are able to actually play different. Good teachers are actually able to play different parts as a situation warrants. Yeah, because they are empty. Yeah, yeah. Angry with this person. I mean, kind of feigned anger with this person. Huh. Sad with that person logical with that person and so on it doesn't really make any difference yeah right because they're not they're no longer grabbing they're no longer tightening the grip around having or trying to be somebody mm -hmm. right it's just the complete fungibility of 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 shunyata revealing itself in a particular form that has a limited duration for that part of the play so to say it's very liberating right, right. I, th I think we've had this experience. I don't know what you, but I, I, I do more and more impersonations these days. There's, 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 there's you know, more and more uh, fun mm -hmm. I, I tend to have. You know? mm -hmm. you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but the fun is correlated. Yeah. <laughs> the fun is correlated with, I mean, it's at least correlated most simplistically with not taking oneself so damn seriously. Yeah. Yeah, but but that's only a start. You go a little farther, and you say, "Wait a minute, maybe there is no self to take seriously." You keep going down that line, and it's not terror at all. It's yeah. fun and openness and giggly in some cases, and being able to have good sex in other cases because, yeah. and 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 being able to talk with a child and being able to talk with an older person and being able to dialogue with all different sorts of people, and it's no it's no big thing at all. Right. So, I mean, one little joke I tell is that you, you used to, even though we've described all this intensity and this great doubt and these important matters, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that life comes to seem 
if I had to use one bumper sticker now, I'd be life actually comes to seem fundamentally as if it's no big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything, notwithstanding some minor perturbations, mm -hmm. comes to seem as if it's no big deal. Right. But it's only a big deal when you continue to fixate on having to be somebody who plays a certain role or has a certain personality or can do these things but can't do those things and emotes in a certain way and doesn't, you know, couldn't possibly feel anger. Oh, God, couldn't possibly feel anger, you know. Oh, only ever feels the, only ever feels the subtle, subtle kind of, the subtleties of, of modern meles of, of melancholia, you know. Those really refined feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit despondent today. You know, this is right. uh, this is very deep feeling. Yeah. Those, those angry people are just boorish. <laughs> oh, you can you can feel angry. I hate to tell you, but you probably feel angry right now. <laughs> it's yes, this yes, this this sense of um. Yes, this sense of, yes, this sense of, on some level, it seems to do, because I noticed this with, uh, it, there's something about, one of the things I find personally, I find the funniest thing in the world is getting really, is, is human significance, right? Like, oh, yeah. Right, the sense of just the sense of our awkward need for human significance, right? And this, mm -hmm. it's almost like kind of there's something about, I sometimes think about this too. It's like I, I imagine that in, you know, in some way, as far as we can tell, it seems like, it seems like we are the way human being, the sign, mm -hmm. seems to be. It seems to be the 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 way that all that is is essentially open. It's like it's thinned out to itself enough such that it could have a very limited perspective of itself, right? Mm -hmm. Or an opening to itself. It's like on some level, it seems like we're we are that occasion. We are that sight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But boy, if you think about it in terms of time. It like God just opened its like it's like just just opened its little eye. It's like its eye like a mm -hmm. like a fraction of a second ago. It's like brand new, and here we are like mm -hmm. like Bambi on ice. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> I myself, mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. is like, am I okay? No, I'm fine. I'm okay. Like oh, maybe we're gonna. Subtle <laughs> 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 yeah. accent. There. Yeah. Are you okay, <laughs> Tommy? <laughs> right, right. Totally. Totally. Uh -huh. That mm -hmm. sense of yeah, just that sense of, of, you know, on some on some like being, being, yet at the same time stretching, in an awareness of that we are being, at the mm -hmm. same time that we're being, just that, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's just that sense of it of it happening. It's so fucking. It's so. It's. It's stunning, right? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely stunning, and it's absolutely clumsy, and it's absolutely mm. awkward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. And that's yeah, sense. but it only becomes it only becomes fun when you start to see things some speculator talks from the vantage point of eternity. Right? Yeah. When you get enclosed in human significance, then you get to what I'm sure Heidegger, but certainly I would call humanism. Yeah. So that's it's the enclosure mm. and human concerns that gets us in trouble because then things start to seem unbeknownst to ourselves very serious indeed. Right. And right. I call this very simply drama. You talk to people and it's always drama. You know, you talk to a, you talk to a genuine Zen teacher and he has nothing to tell you because there's no drama. He's he's he's, he's certainly fine in silence. He's very little to say. How are you doing? I'm doing well. As, as one koan case puts it, every day is a good day. After enlightenment, every day is a good day. And that's a, that's a genuine statement. But if you enclose human significance up in on itself, then it does become narcissistic. Yeah. As it becomes narcissistic, it continues to perpetuate various dramas. Yeah. 
Yeah. And as the dramas continue to perpetuate themselves, there's a, there comes to be a kind of perverse seriousness. Mm. And therefore, any, any genuine sense of humor is lost. Mm. So the opening up mm. to, uh, to a fundamental, let's say opening up to Shunyata or beginning to open up to Shunyata it is also the, the, the beginning of uh, non-perverse, completely wholesome laughter. Mm. 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 Things are just, things, things finally are, 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 nothing is so serious. And I'm not, I'm not speaking nihilistically, as you well know, yeah. right? This is beyond the pale of nihilism on the, on the yonder side and the hinter side right. <laughs> to use the of nihilism. It's like, oh, <laughs> everything is, it's fine. It's yeah. no big deal. Yeah. There's nothing, what you're talking about is not even remotely significant. And it's not, you can be compassionate, but it's not even remotely, it's not even remotely significant. The length of time it took you to uh, adjust your cabinet in the kitchen <laughs> is, is probably not a matter of ultimate concern. <laughs> and what goes for that <laughs> also goes for the, the, the price of melons <laughs> off season. Right, right, right. totally. <laughs> at, the, at the supermarket. Totally. Uh, goes for that also goes for some of our emotional life too. Emotions are very important, but really attaching ourselves to emotionality as, as some people are wont to do today is, 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 is not, is not wise. Right. Right. So I think what, you know, what I find really beautiful about <clears throat> uh, Zen and Taoism in particular is that there is uh, an effervescence of vital energy that flows through the one who stops taking things so darn seriously and they can just manifest themselves yeah. in creative form or however they manifest themselves. Right. Right. Right now your picture is like that. It's a very thespian in my, <laughs> in my, okay. In my zoom world, you were like that <laughs> for quite some time. So. <laughs> <laughs> So this was this is really really great. I have to I have to have another client to 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 get to, but I really and, and just I I enjoy you. I enjoy connecting with you. I love yeah. I love laughing with you. And I'm let yeah. let's keep talking about this. Let's I want to talk that. about. I also yeah. at some point, I'd love to speak with you more about the relationship, uh, the relationship between sunyata and logos. Oh, cool. Yeah. Like uh, Chris, I asked Chris, um, I asked him, uh, you know, what he thought about the relationship was, and he said something really, really great. He, uh, just to leave us, leave us contemplating until the next time we talk. He said, um, sunyata, uh, sunyata is the native sound of logos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, maybe I can make it be more like it's the native soundless sound of logos. Right. Yeah. Let's talk more about that next time. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. Take good care. Thanks so much good for this. You. Yeah. May you and you and the nothing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it will make you us and the nothing this is like each other infinitely. <laughs> okay. Gosh, <laughs> palm <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll tell you how it goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye now.